morning's lesson, getting close to the end of this series. Makes sense for us to talk about Jesus' promise of his coming, second coming, that is. <clears throat> now, first, I want to I start with the definition of the word promise. I, I think we all know what it means, but just be clear here when we're talking about the title. The verb promise means to assure someone that something will, of some, want, to assure someone that one will definitely do, give, or arrange something, undertake, or declare that something will happen. The noun promise is a declaration or assurance that one will do a particular thing, or that a particular thing will happen. Jesus himself only uses the word promise once in the Gospels, referring to the Holy Ghost as the promise of the Father. But a promise is a clear declaration of something that is certain. And this is something that Jesus did often. How, how many, I, I know one of my favorite parts of the Bible when Jesus is speaking is, he'll say, verily, verily, I say unto thee. Verily, verily, truly, truly. With of a truth, absolutely. This is, this is a fact. Mm -hmm. And so anytime he says verily, verily, you can be sure that whatever he <laughs> says after that is absolute. Jumping ahead to the golden truth, I do want to go ahead and read that first thing we read in John 14 and 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus had just told his disciples that he was leaving to prepare a place for them. And in verse 3, he said, I will come again. The word will means expressing inevitable events. It indicates a certainty. This is a promise, even if the word promise is not used. How can we know anything of certainty in the future. How can we as humans know anything of certainty in the future? I might say, I will go to work tomorrow, but I cannot accurately predict sickness, accident, or weather which could hinder me from fulfilling those words that I spoke. Jesus, on the other hand, he's not so limited as we are in that respect. We only need to look at history through the pages of the Bible to know the certainty of the promises of God. All the way back in the fifth book of the Bible, we have a clear prophecy of Jesus and a way to understand how to recognize the promises of God. Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 22. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. I'm speaking to Moses here. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that he shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shalt we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. By this we know that God's words will not fail. We can see a multitude of promises fulfilled throughout the Bible. In addition, since then, many promises in the Bible have been fulfilled in our own days. History backs up God's promises. Jesus himself is said to have fulfilled over 300 prophecies through his own existence. We have verifiable, documented proof that the word of God will come to pass as he has said. He has not yet failed once. 
any supposed prophet with anything less than a 100% success rate is a charlatan, according to the Word of God. Because God never fails. His words are true and His promises certain. Just as sure as the prophecies of His birth, His return to gather all of God's children to Himself are just as sure. I'm getting into the commentary here. In lesson 11, it was noted that Jesus used the word church directly only twice, but referred to it in other terms frequently. The same is true concerning a second coming, especially of the first phase or the rapture. The following is a quotation from the Bible Training Institute study course on the prominent teachings of the Church of God. For the Christian world, the second coming of Jesus is the most intriguing of Bible doctrines. In these last days, there has been a flood tide of printed materials on the subject. Through the years, assembly, de 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 sorry, assembly, assembly deliberations on the return of Christ at best have been limited. For the record, there are only a few questions and answers on the second coming in the assembly minutes. The General Assembly has approved the 18th prominent teaching, the premillennial second coming of Jesus, wherein, one, the dead saints are resurrected and caught away with the living saints together to meet the Lord in the air. Now, the biblical support for that can be found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 18. 13 through 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an ar the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then... We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And number two, the Lord will reign on earth a thousand years. This we know that no prophecy of the scripture is, is of any private interpretation according to 2 Peter 1 and 20. That is backed up in the 20th chapter of Revelation where we read in verses 1 through 6. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Excuse me. And he laid hold on, that, on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should, not deceive, the nation, he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath a part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Most commentators count only the second phase of his second coming, since he will not come all the way to earth in the first phase. However, the rapture is a part of his second coming, according to the promise. <clears throat> Once again, that, the golden truth here is that promise. Now, this is Jesus speaking here. I want to go ahead and read this again. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Part one, the initial promise. <clears throat> John 14, 1 through 4. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. It was a night unlike any other night, the night before Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. It was also the night of the Last Supper, before its eternal fulfillment. Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, John 13 and 1. Events were beginning to transpire that would separate him and his disciples physically. He was sensing a great love for them, according to John 13, 1, 33 and 35. Knowing the initial turmoil which they would experience before the dawn of another day, now, as I was studying this, the thought came to my mind that I'd never, never imagined before. In His eternal glory, God has the ability to move from time to time more easily than we as humans move from room to room. <clears throat> In eternity, time is irrelevant. God isn't bound by time. There's no waiting for things to happen. There's no anticipation of future events. They all exist simultaneously outside of the confines of time, which only affect humanity. But Jesus, God in the flesh, had been separated from the fullness of this freedom for over 33 years. At this time of year, we celebrate Jesus' birth, but we forget that to God, this was his very first experience of being trapped within the single moment that we call now. I love the thought of now. We only live in now. When I said those words, we only live in now, a few moments ago, it's only a few moments in the past, but I can't go back to that. I can think about what, I can read what I'm going to say here in, a, in just a few minutes, but I can't get ahead to that time. I am stuck in the very words that are coming out of my mouth as I speak them. God doesn't have that limitation. But when Jesus came to this earth, he was limited in that same way that we are. He was limited to the now in which we live. As I said earlier, God, the eternal God, he can travel through time. He can, he can kick back and watch the, the battle of Armageddon or he can go and watch uh, ba uh, the, the defeat of Jericho anytime. He can just see those things happening in real time the only way we can describe it because we're humans we don't understand outside of time thought but all of those things are current to God the, the, the distant future is current to God the distant past is current to God but Jesus separated himself from that freedom and was trapped in this thing that we call time we can remember the past but we can't go there we can anticipate the future, but we have no power to make it arrive more quickly. On the contrary, the more we look forward to a future event, the longer it seems to take to arrive. Who, who can testify? We're looking forward to something that seems like it's forever. When, when, you're, when you're coming up on the beginning of the week, Friday, looking forward to Friday, well, that first couple of days may come quick. But when you're sitting there looking at the clock at 4.30, that last half an hour, waiting for 5 o'clock to come around so you can take off, it seems like a really long time when you're ready to go. We have no power over time. We're constrained by its influences. We have no way to get around that. And so Jesus, the Son of God, was willing to confine himself in time. As we're talking about this... Uh, this particular situation here with the, uh, on the eve of his crucifixion, the ne very next day. <clears throat> Jesus had waited a lifetime. He had waited. God never had to wait before. But Jesus waited 33 years. He knew what was coming. He knew the purpose that he had come to this earth for. He had trained and led his disciples preparing them for the time when he would be physically absent from them. Listen to Jesus' own words here in Luke 22, 15 and 16. 
And he said unto them, With desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This night had been a long time in coming for Jesus. Once again, think about eternity without having to be confined by time, and then suddenly you're trapped. You can't make things happen more quickly. You can't make things happen more slowly. You're there in the now, just like we are. As much as the flesh, Jesus' flesh, may have dreaded what was to come in pain and agony, Regardless of how painful the separation from God the Father would be as He would soon hang on the cross, He knew that all of this would be for God's glory and for the eternal benefit of every soul who would turn to Him through the ministry of His disciples. God the Son, trapped in time, would soon return to the eternity from whence He came. Eternity doesn't stop for time to take up. When God said, let there be light, eternity didn't stop. Eternity continues on. Eternity won't regain uh, its composure again after, after uh, the end times. Eternity's been going on the entire time. Of course, no time has passed because it's timeless. But we, we here on earth, we're talking about the second coming here, we're talking about the rapture, we here on earth are required to wait for the ultimate fulfillment of his promise. But to God in heaven, the past, present, and future have no such limitations. This is why his promises are certain. This is how we can have full assurance of the truth of the things that he said. In the meantime... It's our responsibility to trust Him and lead others to the fullness of His truth while time remains. Sometime earlier when Jesus had told them what was to befall Him, when they reached Jerusalem, a strife arose among the twelve as to which should be counted the greatest. Apparently, they still thought Jesus would set up His earthly kingdom. Who would be given the highest seat in that kingdom? Now, we have reference to several examples of this situation from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But Paul reminds us in Romans 11:25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has become in. Now, generally... We, we apply this Jewish rejection to the person of Messiah in, in Jesus. This blindness, that's how we apply this. But would this not equally apply to the disciples who remain blind to the true purpose of Jesus until after his resurrection? They were, it's very clear by this situation in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that the disciples were awaiting him to set up his kingdom on earth. They were awaiting him to, to step up and overthrow their uh, Roman oppressors. But even though Jesus had told them of his end, they were shocked when it came to pass. After his crucifixion, they went back to their old jobs, their old lives. It wasn't until he revealed himself after his resurrection that the disciples first began to grasp the smallest portion of his promise, his promises. And it wouldn't be until the day of Pentecost that they would actually move forward with spreading the promise of God for all who would believe. On the day of Pentecost, we read that Peter said in Acts 2 and 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord God, our God shall call. What promise is that? Not simply the promise of the Holy Ghost, although that was a part of it, but the promise that it would be through the blood of Jesus that we would all have the same access to eternity with God. This is the promise of the return of Jesus when he comes to call us home 
to be with him forever. Now, back in the commentary, immediately following the Last Supper, the evening's frustrating events began with a vivid and humbling lesson in humility when Jesus washed their feet. Characteristic of Peter, he vehemently resisted allowing his Lord and Master to be his servant. But Jesus continued and explained what he had done to them. Then, almost in the same breath, he announced a betrayer among their number. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Matthew 26, 22. Even after Jesus' dismissal, none but John and possibly Peter knew who the betrayer would be. Now, a fact that's often overlooked in this passage is that right up until this moment, Judas was there among them. Before he left to betray Jesus, his master knelt down and washed his feet. Jesus washed Judas' feet. Jesus knew who would betray him. Still, he willingly got on his knees and washed Judas' feet. Judas' fate was not sealed even though he would soon sell out the Savior of the world for 30 pieces of silver, Jesus died for Judas as well. The blood that cleansed the 11 was effective enough to cleanse Judas also. By his own choice, he forfeited his soul. There is not one on earth that Jesus did not die to save. His promise remains to whosoever will. That is, anyone who calls on the name of Jesus has the opportunity for eternal life. Back in the commentary, Peter was anxious because he didn't understand where Jesus was going, and he couldn't go with him. He said that he would never be offended in Jesus, even if all men were. That can be found in Matthew 26, 31 through 33. He was ready to go with him, both into prison and into death. That's Luke 22:33 and John 13:37. But likewise also said they all in Mark 14:31. Now Peter said that he would never forsake Jesus, and we're often hard on him for his failure. But we clearly read here and so said they all. But with the events in the Garden of Gethsemane and with Jesus' arrest, we read in Matthew 26 and 56, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. They ran away. Peter wasn't the only one to forsake his Lord. All of them ran away. And then also in Mark 14 and 50, we read the same thing. And all forsook him and fled. But before this happened, we read of a very important event. The other gospel writers don't give the fisherman warrior a name, but we read in John 18 and 10, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Peter had said that he was willing to go to prison and to death for Jesus. Now, fact of the matter is, this action proved the sincerity of those words that he had spoken. Yet we read in the very next verse, John 18, 11, Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword to the sheath. The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Now, suddenly, Peter was confused. Now, perhaps he was still thinking that Jesus would set up that uh, earthly kingdom and throw off Roman oppression. Whatever his thoughts were, his amazement and confusion was clear. Now, going back just a little bit, earlier, Jesus had told them to buy a sword, sell your garment and buy a sword. But now he was telling them not to use them. Peter's confusion in the matter was justified, but he had missed the purpose behind that sword that Jesus had told them to buy. Immediately after Jesus had told them to sell their garments and buy swords, the very next verse Jesus said, For I say unto you, 
that this is that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. He was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. Peter had missed that part of the message. Jesus was reckoned among the transgressors because of, of Peter's zealous protection of his Lord. He had attacked a fellow Jew in defense of a, of a criminal by the Jewish views of the situation. That would certainly make Peter a transgressor, transgressor of the Jewish law. And this would solidify the Jewish case against Jesus. As Jesus had said earlier, the things concerning me have an end. That is, the end of his earthly ministry, yet his eternal promises will prevail. <clears throat> then Jesus' prediction of Peter's denial added to the distress of the turbulent night. Only John gives full record of Jesus' comforting yet frank discourse in chapters 14 through 17. It's some of the best reading in the Bible before they left the upper room and followed him to the Garden of Gethsemane. Perhaps our, next, our text verses were the most cherished of all. He bolstered their faith by saying, You believe in God, believe or have faith also in me. They were to trust him in those things which were frustrating. Now, Peter was certainly frustrated. He had the same opportunity to fall away as Jesus had. But Peter held fast to Jesus even after his denial. He acknowledged his failure and persevered that much more to prove his faithfulness to his Lord and Savior. As Jesus said elsewhere, he who forgives much, who is forgiven much, loves much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. Now Peter had been forgiven much. And he used his own failures to strengthen his testimony of the saving power of Christ and the outworking of the Holy Ghost in his life. God's promises are sure. But we must remain faithful through any frustration this world or the enemy of our souls can throw at us. And Jesus' ultimate comforting promise, I will again, I will come again and receive you to myself. Part two, the two phases. Part A, coming for his saints. Matthew 24, 36, 37, 40, and 41. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Jesus' references to his coming for the rapture are not always clear as differentiated from his coming to reign. It appears as if the passages cited here pertain to the rapture since the day and the hour are secret. The activities of the world will be going on as usual, which can hardly be said of the second phase. The men in the field and the women at the mill will be taken up according to their individual readiness. Jesus likened the events of his return to the days of Noah. Now, we don't know how long it took Noah to build the ark. It wasn't 120 years of so many states since he was not called to build the ark until after the birth of his three sons and two years after the flood, Shem was 100 years old. Now, that's irrelevant to this point here. But we can be certain that he was warning anyone who questioned his actions. 2 Peter 2 and 5 describes Noah as a preacher of righteousness. However long it took, the Bible makes it clear that on the last day, only Noah and his family were prepared for this disaster. In the days of Noah, God's promise was fulfilled to the destruction of many. We have his account as a testimony of God's faithfulness to his promises. The time of the rapture will be no different. The ark is currently continuing to be under construction. The warnings must be made clear. The truth must be proclaimed so that every soul has the opportunity to escape this greatest of all disasters. God's promises are sure. 
Are we, as individuals, prepared for that time? Are we helping others to see the tragedy of not being prepared? Souls are hanging in the balance. Back in the commentary, Paul describes the, the event in detail. It evidently had been revealed to him by the Holy Ghost or in some private session with Jesus similar to a statement concerning the Lord's Supper. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, 1 Corinthians 11.23. He relates the first resurrection of the rapture immediately following. The 1 Corinthians 15.51-54 Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump of the Lord shall, trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, that when, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that are right unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that day, that, that day should take, overtake you as a thief. You are all children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that are be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort one yourselves together and edify one another, even as ye so do. The fact that those who are being addressed are not appointed to wrath, but to obtain their ultimate salvation would indicate that reference is to the rapture. <clears throat> Part B, coming with the saints. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. Thessalon 1 Thessalonians 3 and 13. To the end that He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. 1 Thessalonians 3, 13 points definitely to a time of Christ, the time of Christ's return with His glorified saints. The very power of the heavens and heavenly bodies will be reacting to the judgmental fury of this final tribulation. When the sign of the Son of Man and all His saints and angels intrudes upon the raging battle of Armageddon, a great mourning will pervade the scene. All the tribes of the earth could refer to the tribes of Israel scattered throughout the earth. The second coming will erase all doubt from their minds as to his Messiahship. They will look upon him whom they have pierced or crucified, and they shall mourn for him, Zechariah 12 and 10. Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also that pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth, not the Jews only, shall wail because of him, Revelation 1 and 7. He will come and all the holy angels with him. He will swiftly put an end to the battle of all battles, Revelation 19, 11 through 21. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. The millennial reign will begin. Part three, a final admonition. Matthew 16 and three. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern... But can ye not discern the signs of the times? Matthew 24 and 43. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. On one of many occasions where the Pharisees and Sadducees were tempting Jesus, 
They desired him that he would shew them a sign from heaven, Matthew 16 and 1. Once again, branding them as hypocrites, he rebuked their spiritual blindness in not being able to discern the signs of the times. They were rejecting his messiahship and hoped to disprove it by demanding him to display his power. Even so, he refused to bow to the temptation just as he had done in his early confrontation with Satan himself, Matthew 4, 5 through 7. The admonition in, in this to us is to discern the signs of our own times as we relate the scriptures to current events. Now, no prophecy stands out more to me than Isaiah 5 and 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And what time have the truths of these verses been more evident the love of lost souls is considered a hate crime, mm -hmm. while evil abounds with new user-friendly labels. If one sought to rescue the drowning, he must first consider if the family will sue him for trying. Animals are lifted up as gods, and children are slaughtered without thought. Confusion is wisdom, and common sense is insanity. If we are not living in the end of days, who could imagine a, more, a time more suited to this description? God's promises will be fulfilled. Are we truly prepared? Are we doing our part to help prepare others? The time is surely short. As the good men of our own houses, Jesus admonishes us to be ever ready for his return for the rapture. <clears throat> The way we live daily speaks to the thief as to whether he can break up our houses. Leaving our doors and windows open to temptation and sin also leaves us open to being left behind when the last trump sounds. Jesus is not coming to steal, but to receive unto himself those whom he has redeemed with his own blood and for whom he has prepared a place. And those who would enter that prepared place must also be prepared. This reminds me of a conclusion of last week's lesson, 1 Peter 4 and 17 and 18. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? This description is, is of one... is. This description is of that one church, true church Jesus described. The ark of safety for these last days. We are promised that there will be a shaking time. Now is our opportunity to be certain that as individuals, we are where we need to be in the plan of God. The church will prevail over every attack of the enemy. We do not have that assurance as individuals. Simply having your name on the church roll does not ensure a spot in glory. It's up to us to prepare ourselves to endure anything that the enemy of our souls might throw at us in attempt to cause our departure from the straight and narrow way. We read in Revelation 19, 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and to give honor to, unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. God provides the ability, but it remains up to us to avail ourselves of it. Remember the parable of the ten virgins. They were all virgins. They all started with their lights burning brightly. But only the wise had fully prepared for the delayed time before the bridegroom's call. <clears throat> His call is drawing closer with every day. And with every breath we take, his promise will be fulfilled with or without us. Now is the time of preparation. Now is the only hope we have for a brighter future. Now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Don't give up. Don't give in. Press on a little further. The prize is almost in sight. 
the conclusion in the final chapter of the last book of divinely inspired Holy Writ, the Son of the living God speaks to us from his place at the right hand of the Father, giving us one last and double warning. Behold, I come quickly. Surely I come quickly. This does not mean that his promise to come, he promised to come soon after he had spoken those words. Rather, it means that when the Father's time arrives, he will suddenly appear. And we, will we join the Apostle John in saying, Amen, even so come Lord Jesus. Are we so anxious to be with him where he is as a part of the apostles, as were the apostles when he was about to depart and go to prepare a place for them? Jesus, let us be reminded that one of their number was a vicious traitor. Yes, even a devil. Then let us remember the apostle Peter's presumptuous fleshly confidence only to deny his Lord and Master, lest he be arrested and made to share in his trial and death. Yes, we rejoice that Peter repented, wept, wept bitterly when the cock's crowing reminded him of his failure. Matthew 26 and 75. We rejoice further at his three declarations of love for the resurrected Master in John 21, 15 through 21. But since these things are written for our admonition, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 11, let us be admonished now rather than have to repent and weep later, perhaps too late. Or like Judas, hang ourselves and go to our own place rather than, be, than that blessed place which Jesus has gone to prepare for his own. Jesus is coming again. We don't have assurance of the timing of that coming, but we know that he's coming. And now is the time to be prepared. Now is the time not only to prepare ourselves to make sure that we are ready as individuals, but now is the time to reach out to others and help them to recognize their need while there's opportunity. We praise the Lord for this time we've had this morning. Go ahead and turn it over.